Hi everybody, my name's Kate Irving and I want to talk to you um, about dementia. I've spent the last 20 years of my life uh, working with people with dementia and studying dementia. And um, dementia is an umbrella term for about 200 different diseases, all of which cause a similar-ish sort of a pattern. But I want to spend the next 10 minutes telling you about what dementia is not. And I've based this talk around four myths that when I talk to people about dementia seem to believe are true. And I want to spend the next 10 minutes telling you why they are not true. Oh, that's, that's not right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the first myth is that uh, dementia cannot be prevented. Well, this might be arguably true. So that's not a good start, is it? But... <laughs> Um, it's a point of semantics, because dementia is a disease of ageing, predominantly. And if we delay d dementia for, by as little as five years, we practically wipe it out in the population. We certainly reduce it by at least 50%. Um, when, when you think about, about an individual with dementia, and, and by, by rights, there must be people in this room who know somebody very close to them who has dementia, Every single one of those, 50% less, would make a huge difference if it was your relative with dementia. So there's a, there's, there is a pendulum swinging. The older you get, the more likely you are to have dementia. But there are hundreds of things we can do to slow down that pendulum swing, to slow the momentum, and um, to give ourselves more healthy years. There are nine modifiable risk factors that have been heavily researched, and now we have very good evidence to show that these things make a real difference. They are, they are attributable to about 50% of your risk of getting dementia. And okay, it may be boring advice, and, and Noel's kind of done the job, for, Niall's done the job already for me, telling, telling you about physical activity, cognitive activity, midlife obesity, um, addressing low mood, uh, eating a Mediterranean diet, having healthy cholesterol levels, uh, healthy blood pressure levels, drinking in moderation, not smoking. Okay, so you've heard it all before. You've heard it for heart disease, you've heard it for stroke, and you've heard it for cancer, but it's also the case for dementia. And this might make you change your behaviour, but it might, and I think it's not worth making a secret of it, that these are 50% of your attributable risk for get, whether you will get late-life dementia. And I think that's really important. So this is a call for hyperactivism on our parts. There are 40... 8,000 people in Ireland today who have dementia. That number is set to double, and nearly all of the effort to decrease that number of people will come from these nine risk factors, from us in the population reducing these nine risk factors. Of course, we can't say if you live this lifestyle, you definitely won't get dementia, because there are other factors as well, factors we don't understand very well and factors we're beginning to understand a little better. But nonetheless, which group do you want to be in? Do you want to be in the high-risk group or do you want to be in the low-risk group? <laughs> this picture here is one of my favourite pictures. Um, I, I don't know how well you can see it, so I'll jump around a bit and explain what's going on. On this side of the slide, you've got people being wheeled up to this fountain of youth. They're sick and they're elderly and they go into the... This is a 16th century uh, picture, so it's not a new idea that we should stay young, we should be young... Uh, they jump in the fountain of use, and th then on this side, they're, they're jumping out, and they're feasting on a table. I'm not quite sure what that couple under the tree are up to, and the lady getting into the tent seems like she's certainly not sick and elderly anymore. This idea, this kind of docility that waiting for a cure gives us is the, the biggest message that I want to, to give you today. We can't afford to wait for a fountain of use. We have the tools to do what we need to do to really, really reduce the numbers of people in our population with dementia. Myth number two. Dementia is a disease with a diagnosis. Well, there are three things you need for a diagnosis. The first one is etiological validity. This means that everybody with that diagnosis has come across a similar cause. So, for example, if I had TB that would mean I'd come across the same bug as the next person with dementia. This isn't really quite true for dementia, because all the 48,000 people in Ireland today who have dementia will have, have a completely different set of those nine risk factors that we looked at earlier. 
and some others that we don't know about. It just isn't true that uh, everybody has the same cause for dementia. It's, it's, it's a very dodgy um, diagnostic criteria in the case of dementia. The second is phenomenological validity. So what this means is that everybody with that category or that diagnosis must look similar in some way. Well, I've been caring for people with dementia as a nurse for, for 20 years now. And I can tell you, if you've met one person with dementia, you've just met one person with dementia. They never look the same. Some people in the earliest times of memory pro present with just memory problems. Some people present with mood disorders. Some people present with behavior changes. Some people have full insight into their memory problems and say, oh, I can't remember anything. And other people say, oh, there's no problem with my memory. And then they tell you the same story again two minutes later because there are problems, but they have no insight into those memory problems. But I've never met two people with dementia who are the same. I'm continually astonished at the, the variety of different ways that dementia can look. So I would argue that dementia doesn't really have phenomenological validity. And the third criteria for a diagnosis is prognostic validity. And this means that everybody with that disease will get, follow a particular trajectory. They'll get worse at a, a fairly similar rate. And this just isn't true for dementia. At the point of diagnosis, people can get worse very quickly. They might, get, they might plateau out for a, a good while and then drop off and get bad quite quickly. They might live for five years. They might live for two years. They might live for 10 years. And in fact, I'm still in touch with people from Australia when I worked in a memory clinic there who were diagnosed 15 years ago, and they're still emailing me. So this prognostic validity is also very dodgy when we think about dementia. Myth number three, there's nothing you can do once you have dementia. Well, let's start with a fact. There's a lot we can do to make people with dementia worse. We can give them certain drugs. We can put them in an understimulating environment. We can uh, talk down to them or otherwise demean them. And we know that this will make a person with dementia get worse, get worse quickly. So it is at least plausible that there are things that we can do that will support a person with dementia. Stop them from an unravelling of the personhood and a demeaning and, a, and a, an unravelling of self-esteem, which has an absolutely catastrophic effect on functioning. I'm not asking for cure. What I'm looking for is a championing, champion, championing, championing of uh, human resilience that we look to ways to support and to scaffold people with dementia so that their own resilience can flourish. The fourth myth I want to talk to you about is that people with dementia can't live normally in the community. This is probably the most complex of all of the myths, and it's the one that causes the most problem for people with dementia. It causes a thing I usually call overcaring, and it is born of wanting to keep people with dementia safe. So very often I work with community groups and they say, oh, well, we, we, you know, we used to take so-and-so to the match, but we were a bit frightened he might run off. Well, it's not my experience that people with dementia run off. And if you do, then one has to ask, well, was the company not so good? But. <laughs> But the, the serious point here is that with very, very little support, people with dementia can live normally and be valued members, members of our communities for a long time into the disease. We've underexplored how we can support and how we can scaffold people, but nonetheless, we can. So in summary... One very seminal writer in the field of dementia, a, a guy called Tom Kitwood, who's from the north of England in, in Bradford, not far from where I'm from, said that dementia equals P plus B. I like sums because it makes me sound vaguely scientific, but anyway. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what that means is that dementia doesn't happen to a brain. It happens to a person. It happens to a person who has a personality, who has a biography, a whole life they've lived, who has, yes, some not neurological impairment. Of course, we're not denying there's something physiological going on with dementia. 
and they also have their own psychology and they have their own resources in their physical health. And it is in responding to people with dementia individually because there's a different permutation of all of this, this addition in every individual who gets dementia and therefore our response to that person needs to be individualised and tailored. And the more we can understand this sum and how in any one individual it's adding together to form dementia, the better we will become at responding to people with dementia, holding them so that they can age in place in our communities and not be warehoused in large nursing homes where, let's face it, none of us want to end up. Thank you very much for listening.